Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to start, of course, by thanking uh, Tom Harrison and, and Jan Haywood um, for welcoming here to this Herodotian virtual uh, space. Um, but I would also like to, to thank especially Francesca Gazzano, who wanted me here, uh, invited me here in, 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 in first place. Um, and I take this opportunity also to publicly express my gratitude to my supervisors, uh, Jason Koenig and Gianfranco Agosti, without whose constant support and expertise, my PhD, which now is getting close to an end, uh, would have been a completely different uh, and much less enjoyable uh, experience. Um, in this paper, you will hear about the importance of the Herodotian model in early Byzantine historiography and especially in the two major historians of the age of Justinian, Procopius of Caesarea and Agathias Scholasticus. Even though my doctoral research concentrates on this latter, so on Agathias and on his histories in five books, today you'll hear more about Procopius. During these last years, I came to realize how important it was to look at the literary and historical choices Procopius, Agathias' predecessor, made in order to understand those that Agathias may not. But let's go in order. I would like to start with a brief introduction to early Byzantine historiography, for it will help us better contextualize what we are going to look at today. With early Byzantine historiography, I refer to that extensive literary production from approximately the fourth to the seventh century. Um, this large literary output tends to be divided into three subgenres, ecclesiastical historiography, chronicles, and classicizing historiography. The names speak for themselves, but I will still just spend a few words delineating the main features of each of those. Um, ecclesiastical historiography, or maybe I should just keep staying here. Ecclesiastical historiography, famously initiated by Eusebius of Caesarea during the time of Constantine, was one of the most productive genres of late antiquity. It was still much in auge in the sixth century, our period of interest for today's paper, thanks especially to Evagrius Scholasticus, whose ecclesiastical history is a true repository of historical and literary information. But the production of ecclesiastical historiography was by no means limited to Greek, quite a typical aspect of the plurilinguistic late antique society. If we just think, one among many, of the Syriac ecclesiastical history of John of Ephesus. As the name suggests, the primary aim of ecclesiastical historiography was to tell the history of the church, but being the history of the church at this chronological height, deeply intertwined with secular history, it follows that ecclesiastical historiography in practice could deal with any kind of event. Chronicles, which certainly were not an invention of this period, it suffices to think of a work like Atticus uh, Liber Annalis, mentioned and praised by Cicero, knew a true awakening in early Byzantium. The major difference with ecclesiastical and classicizing historiography was in the format, a year per year structure and a lower Linguist, um, stylistic and linguistic level, though to take chronicles as perfect examples and mirrors of contemporary spoken language would be a mistake. Since it is of the age of Justinian we are talking about today, the major chronicler of that period whose name deserves to be mentioned here is certainly that of John Malalas, whose work had rightly started to receive a lot of attention by Byzantinists and late antique scholars over the last decades. Finally, classicizing historiography. Those historians who could, we could consider Eunapius of Sardis writing in the fourth century, author also of the famous lives of the philosophers and sophists, the first in line, created a true historiographical continuity, a ciclo -storico, historical cycle, just like that of Herodotus, Thucydides and Xenophon. This idea of creating historiographical continuity, it must be stressed, was looked for and achieved also by ecclesiastical historians and chroniclers. But what were the specific features of these classicizing historians we are going to talk about today? 
What characterizes them is certainly the fact that they were writing following the model of classical historiography, that is to say, chiefly of Herodotus and Thucydides, who were largely studied at school. This choice is reflected both in the formal aspects of their work and in the contents. The language that we find in Priscus, Procopius, Agathias, or Menander the Protector, also known as Menander the Godman, Godsman, is an archaicizing, atticizing Greek, definitely far from that spoken in contemporary Constantinople. This is by no means achieved by all of them with the same techniques or tools, and the variety of results is one of the aspects that make the study of early Byzantine historiography so fascinating and important. Each historian uses a different Greek, and that Greek might reflect different stages of the evolution of the language, be it in the use of the dative, or participles, or duals. The choice of contents as well was modeled on that of ancient historians. We find mostly battles, sieges, highly rhetorized speeches, natural phenomena, I say mostly because, of course, a caveat that should always be kept in mind is not to read such a various, not to read such a various and wide production, also in chronological terms, as a unity, or just as a mere imitation of classical historiography. It was not. Though, funnily enough, in today's presentation, I will concentrate precisely on the role of tradition. These authors' individualities shaped their works and their different literary choices. After this quick and certainly not exhaustive introduction to early Byzantine historiography, let me just take a few more minutes to say a word on the historians that we are going to deal with today, Procopius and Agathias. The first has certainly less need for presentations. He lived during the first half of the sixth century and was active protagonist of the many historical events of the period, marked by the beginning of Justinian's reign and his renovatio in Peri, the attempt to reconquer the previously Roman territories, territories now controlled by Ostrogoths in Italy, Vandals in North Africa, Visigoths in Southern Spain. Procopius was a protagonist because he was the paredros or assessor, so the secretary or chief of staff of Belisarius, the most famous and important among Justinian's generals. Procopius' literary production is composed by three extremely different works, up to the point that the paternity of the anecdota, the fierce satire against Justinian and his entourage, has been long debated, though it is now to take for granted. He provides us with the most important and diverse picture of the reign on the reign of Justinian and is considered one of the greatest historians of antiquity, and with good reason. Though the flow of bibliography on many aspects of his work does not seem to stop, there are still aspects lacking recent or comprehensive study. If this is the situation for Procopius, one can just imagine how much work can still be done on Agathias, who took up and continued Procopius' wars. Uh, too much? Okay. Agathias was approximately three decades younger than his predecessor, a lawyer by necessity, so he writes, and a lover of literature, especially poetry, he was an active protagonist of the 6th century Byzantine revival of the epigram, both as an author and as an editor. He gathered contemporary epigrams and created the cycle, whose compositions were subsequently incorporated in the Palatine and in the Planudian anthologies. But most importantly for us today, he was also a historian, though a very different one from Procopius. His histories are left unfinished, for he almost certainly died during the writing, and managed to cover only seven years, though the quantity and variety of digressions make the chronological span covered much wider. Despite the enormous interest of this work in literary, linguistic, and historical terms, the most comprehensive study remains Avril Cameron's 1970s monograph, uh, the first and last on the topic, and her two long articles on the two main excursuses of the work, the one of the Merovingians and those on the Sassanids. Several valuable articles focusing on different aspects of this work appeared in the last decades, but the state of art is far from being considered satisfactory. For many decades, especially at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the awareness of the importance of the model of Herodotus and Thucydides in, early Byzantine, in, in the early Byzantine Empire produced a number of classical, classic philological studies devoted, as it was customary, 
to spot and list linguistic borrowings and word for word imitations. This happened both for Procopius and for Agathias. Those approaches proved to be not always useful and at times not even entirely correct, especially when they were used to draw conclusions on the author's knowledge of the model. The usual conclusion was, if there is not clear and exact imitation, it means that Procopius slash Gathias um, never read or knew the author. Now the influence of Herodotus and Thucydides on early Byzantine historiography has been largely acknowledged and luckily approached though through a vari variety of different approaches. Mimesis of the classics is no longer considered the only touchstone to evaluate Byzantine historians. Yet, I believe that some, something more can be achieved, especially when it comes to Procopius' debt towards the Herodotian tradition. Belisarius' secretary has always reminded scholars so much of Thucydides, both men of action, protagonists of the event they narrated, that the actual presence of the Herodotian tradition, a wide tradition encompassing centuries of historiography in the wars, has failed to be considered in all its aspects, taking for a fact that Procopius, this peasant in Thucydides, was all rationality and pragmatic political analysis. On the contrary, Agathias, who has always suffered from the comparison with such an important and bulky predecessor, has at times emerged as a historian by chance, whose results, especially in terms of historical, historical accuracy, are to be taken with a grain or two of salt. I will not dwell on this problem today, but I believe that what I have already claimed at the very beginning of this talk stands true. Just like classical historians, these authors must be studied in their individuality. And of course, research can benefit from a comparative approach. It is my methodology for, for my PhD too, but the comparative approach must not be as it has long been built exclusively on the old and somehow, I believe outdated dichotomy, historical accuracy slash lack of, of, uh, of historical accuracy, lack of truthfulness. And Herodotian scholars know well how this opposition did not make a good service in the past to Herodotus when compared to, 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 to Cydides. Almost 20 years ago, um, Anthony Caldellis was already writing that modern readers are interested primarily, if not entirely, in Agathias factual reliability. And he is not praised for being more than a mere historian, he is blamed for being less than a good one. But now let's get to the core of this, of this talk. While working on this PhD, I started to follow a line of inquiry that proved to be much more fruitful than I could envisage. It is that of the presence of myth, mirabilia, and miracles in Procopius. It is on this that I will focus the second and main part um, of this paper, Though for today we will leave myth behind to concentrate only on what I defined for convenience, miracles when involving a divine presence and miriabilia when not. The distinction will sometimes perhaps inevitably blur as we will see. I will argue that the role of the Herodotian tradition in the wars needs to be further investigated, contextualized within a vast background of other models and sources and reassessed. Procopius, in fact, frequently dots his narrative with miracles and mirabilia, and Herodotus and ecclesiastical historiography echo in the war. Agathias, on the contrary, rationalizes mythical and legendary tales and almost completely excludes marvelous material. Now it's time to look at the text. Um, I, I would like to start with what I labeled as battlefield prodigies, though with this label I refer to all those prodigies happened within a military context, not necessarily before or during a battle. In the wars, they are certainly not rare to find. For example, in the second book, what, what you can see here, we are in the Persian War section, we find a passage of extreme interested, interest related to what happened at Antioch before the Persian conquest in 550. We read and, and says, um, a short time before this calamity, God displayed a sign to the inhabitants of that city by which he indicated the things which were to be. 
Terras or Theos and Examenos. So we have precisely the word Terras. For the standards of the soldiers who had been stationed there for a long time had been standing previously toward the west, but of their own accord, they turned and stood towards the east, and they returned again to their former position untouched by anyone. The story is clearly presented as a miracle, and it is explicitly linked to God, who, according to Procopius, wishes to show to the inhabitants of Antioch what will soon happen. A similar prodigy is reported in the third book, the first dealing with the conflict against the Vandals in Northern Africa. In an excursus, Procopius writes that the Emperor, the Emperor Majorinus, who obtained power on the Western part of the empire, and was by then campaigning in Libya against the Vandals, disguised himself as if he were a simple Roman messenger and visited the king Genseric, Gensericus. This latter, in an attempt to impress and scare him, led Majorinus to his huge and well-stocked arms depot. But as soon as the two sovereigns entered, a strange thing happened. Thereupon they say that the weapons shook of their own accord and gave forth a sound of no ordinary or casual sort. And then it seemed to Gisaric that there had been an earthquake. But when he got outside and made inquiries concerning the earthquake, since no one else agreed with him, a great wonder, they say, came over him. But he was not able to comprehend the meaning of what happened. No direct link with a divine action is made explicit here. And neither in book four, where another strange um, event, again, involving weapons, is presented by Procopius as a terrace. One night, while the Romans were encamped near Carthage, a prodigy, a terrace, came to pass in the Roman camp as follows. The tips of their spears were lighted with a bright fire, and the points of them seemed to be burning most vigorously. This was not seen by many, but it filled with consternation the few who did see it, not knowing how it would come out. And this happened to the Romans in Italy again at a much later time. And at that time, since they knew by experience, they believed it to be a sign of victory. But now, as I have said, since this was the first time it had happened, they were filled with consternation and passed the night in great fear. So the event left the soldiers amazed and afraid, and eventually when it happened and appeared for a second time, came to be interpreted as a Nikes uh, symbolon. I acknowledge that this selection is quite narrow and I could have continued with several other passages, but I think it may suffice to demonstrate how Procopius effectively and abundantly uses what was a literary topos, precisely that of battlefield prodigies. One that had a long historiographical tradition behind. Though it is not on the interpretation of these passages that I want to dwell on today, I believe that there is at least a twofold way to read them. The first aspect, more superficial and formal, is Procopius' will to frame his work within a specific tradition, that of classicizing historiography, and especially in the Herodotian strand. The second is that of using these narrative devices to present Justinian's wars and campaigns as providential intended by God. In the field of imperial and late antique historiography only, the most famous and probably uh, the first precedent is that of the famous rain miracle of Marcus Aurelius against the Quadi um, in 172 CE. Christian writers ascribe the miraculous rain that quenched the Roman soldiers to God and to the prayers of the Christian fringe of Marcus Aurelius soldiers. Pagans, on the contrary, brought into play different figures from Jupiter to the Egyptian Magus Arnufis, uh, and even to the alleged author of the Chaldean oracles, Julian the Theurgist. The tradition of miraculous divine intervention became immensely employed also by ecclesiastical historiography, especially in the passages where the historians wanted to prove God's benevolence and protection towards an emperor. It will suffice to mention the famous battle of the Milvian Bridge, the iconic moment within Constantine conversion to Christianity, 
or that of uh, Frigidus, where according to the majority of sources relating the event, God intervened in favor of Theodosius sending a miraculous strong wind against the army of the Western usurper Eugenius. And we could go on. Here, just to give a pause, probably the first and the last from written text, uh, the detail depicting the rain miracle in the Aurelian, Aurelian column in Rome, in, in Piazza Colonna. But I am sure that you all have also been reminded at least uh, of Herodotus 8, 37, 38, the chapters devoted to the prodigies occurred in Delphi before the arrival of the Persian army, among which, as we are now going to see, there was also self-moving weapons. Um, so when the foreigners drew nigh the coming, uh, the prophet, whose name was Aceratus, saw certain sacred arms that no man might touch without sacrilege, brought out, brought out of the chamber within and laid before the shrine. So he went to tell the Delphians of these miracles, Toteras, a miracle, Toteras, but when the foreigners came with all speed near to the temple of Athene Pronea, they were visited by miracles yet greater than the aforesaid, Terea et Mesona, Tuprin. Marvelous indeed it is that weapons of fire should of their own motion appear lying outside before the shrine, but the visitation which followed upon, upon that was more wondrous than aught else ever seen. For when the foreigners were near and they're coming to the temple of Athena and Pronea, they were there were they smitten by thunderbolts from heaven and two peaks break off from Parnassus and came rushing among them with a mighty noise and overwhelmed many of them. And from the temple of Athena, there was heard a shout and a cry of triumph. Those of the foreigners who returned said <clears throat> that they had seen other signs of heaven's working besides the aforesaid. Two men at arms of stature, greater than human, they said, had followed hard after them, slaying and pursuing. The terror of this passage are presented by Herodotus as something theion, alla theia. Um, divine, just like Procopius has explicitly done in the case of the self-moving insignia standards at Antioch, and will do again in the passage that now follows. For sometimes miracles in Procopius are specifically associated to a single person and have nothing to do with the outcome of a battle or of an expedition. This is the case of the passage that we have here, uh, Procopius Wars 3, 4, 4, 6, uh, the prodigy that has um, as protagonist the future Emperor Marcianus and um, strange behavior of an eagle. It says, and somewhere or other among them, so among Genseric prisoners, Martian, quite neglected, was sleeping. Then an eagle flew over him, spreading out his wings, as they say, and always remaining in the same place in air, he cast a shadow over Marcianus alone. And Genseric, upon seeing from the upper story what was happening, since he was an extremely discerning person, suspected that the thing was a divine manifestation, Theionte in Topragma, and summoning the man inquired of him who he might be. Here again, a long historiographical tradition lies behind or beside. The already mentioned ecclesiastic historian Evagrius Scholasticus, roughly contemporary of Procopius, has something very similar about the Emperor Morris, for he reports at the Historia Ecclesiastical 521, all the prodigies happened around the time of his conception and birth, arriving even to say that his reign had been announced by Simon, St. Simeon the Stylite. But since we are dealing with late antique, early Byzantine literature, it would not be fair not to mention Menander Reto, one of the most read authors of late antiquity, almost a handbook, who expressly advises his readers to start a Basilikos Logos, a work or a speech on an emperor, precisely with the prodigies occurred at their birth. And here, that's also. Uh, uh, a small um, passage from, uh, from the work. But again, can we go backwards? Some of you 
might have thought to Herodotus' first book and his account of Cyrus' accession to the throne, with the two dreams of Astyages about his daughter Mandane, Cyrus' mother, that foretell Cyrus' dominion over the Olesia, or again to Herodotus 6, 131, um, and Agaristes, Pericles' mother, famous dream, who, while pregnant, dreams of giving birth to a lion. It is just a selection, and I'm sure that there is more. That's why I'm also very keen to hear your thoughts. There are also passages where nature has the upper hand, whether they are or not presented as miracles linked to God or prodigies that seem to foretell something. Their role within Procopius' narrative seems to have more to do with a taste for natural wonders, mirabilia, and in some case, paradoxography, a genre much in auge in late antiquity and early Byzantium. If we just think of Julius of Sequence, Liber Prodigiorum, the lost collection of Damascus, or the Mirabilia of Phlegon of Tralles. I will provide the name just in one of the next slides. Um, let's start with natural wonders presented as omens. At Wars 4, 14, 5, 6, for example, we find Procopius describing a perpetual eclipse, something that he presents, and rightly so, as a teras dei notaton in this case associated with the end of the first and positive phase in Justinian's reign. And it came about during this year that a most dread portent took place. For the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon, during this whole year. And it seemed it exceedingly like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it is accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, people were free neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. And it was the time when Justinian was in the 10th year of his reign. Just to stay on eclipses, the tradition again was not in existence. Let's just mention Arians and Abbasis and the lunar eclipse before the Battle of Gaugamela in 30, 331, interpreted as a positive omen for Alexander. Or, with a leap forward, to Zosimus, who, at the Storia Nova 458.3, describes the eclipse of, uh, in the Frigidus battle between Theodosius and Eugenius. But again, I think that we can follow the thread backwards to many similar famous Herodotian examples. I think of Herodotus 698 and the famous earthquake at Delos, an island previously considered Akhenaton, immovable. Um, this earthquake is presented as a terras for seeing the sufferings that Darius, Xerxes, and Artaxerxes will bring to Greece. Or, focusing exclusively on eclipses, to Herodotus uh, 174, where we have solar eclipse during the battle between Medians and Lydians, the um, eclipse when Xerxes leaves from Sardis, or the eclipse during Cleombrotus' sacrifices in Book 9. And again, back to Procopius, but to another fruitful category in ancient paradoxography, strange birth. At Procopius War 814-38-40, we read the following passage. But now that I have mentioned the Dessa, I shall not be silent as to the portent which appeared, which appeared there before this present war. When Cosres was about to break the so-called endless peace, a certain woman in the city gave birth to an infant, which in other respects was a normally formed human being, but had two heads. And the meaning, and the meaning of this was made clear by the events which followed. For both Edessa and practically the whole East and the greater part of the Roman Empire to the North came to be fought for by two sovereigns. Herodotus again comes handy. I'm thinking of uh, Herodotus 184.3, where we have the concubine of the mythical king of Sardis Meletis, who gives birth, who has given birth to a lion, or to um, the story at 757, where 
the story and tells of two prodigies encountered by Xerxes on his way to Greece, and they have they both have to deal with uh, they both have to do with with strange births. Uh, there's a horse giving birth to a hare, and the birth of a hermaphrodite mule. In the first two cases, Herodotus himself provides the reader with the explanation of the abnormal events as omens, with words that are closely echoed, I believe, by those that we have just read in Procopius. But before we pass to Agathias, let us also look at natural phenomena presented just and simply as mirabilia, wonders, without any apparent allegoric meaning or role as omens. Um, it is the case of Procopius Wars 6156. Uh, here, for reasons of time, I have decided not to give the entire passages. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, Thomas, uh, described as Taumasion uh, Noion regarding the famous um, Isle of Thule, uh, where for six months there is no sun, and then there are six months without sunset, or Again, uh, Wars 5, 1, 19, um, where Procopius describes the marvelous um, behavior of the tides of the Adriatic Sea near Ravenna. Or again, in Book 8, uh, he describes Teratodes Tis, so something uh, wondrous. Uh, and, and this wonder is the, uh, the tides of the Maliac Gulf in Greece. The flavor of her Dottian historiography does not seem to me difficult to, to spot. Herodotus' interest in natural curiosity is recalled. It suffices to mention, among many examples, the, past, the pages devoted to the Nile's marvelous floods that made lands and plains navigable in history book second, or among many others, the odd behavior of the so called spring of the sun at the histories for 181, um, that the water source that gets increasingly colder during the day, reaching its lowest temperature at midday when the sun is higher to eventually become warm and boiling uh, at night. I could go on with Procopius, but I would rather take some more of your time to turn to Agathias and show you how different his choices were. In five books of histories, the reader never finds a miracle or a prodigy, such as those that we have just seen for Procopius. There is no place here to say in which direction Agathea's literary pensions went, and of which kind of material his histories are filled here in place of the one we find in Procopius. Probably it would also be something external to any kind of Herodotus-related topic. And yet, Something interesting for our topic today can be found, a complete unicum within the work. I am referring to the story of the seven philosophers' journey back to Persia. Just to refresh or explain what I am talking about, um, according to Agathias, our only source about this extraordinary event, which has spurred a decade-long debate among scholars, when Justinian decreed in 529 that pagans could no longer take part public life, the new Platonic philosophers and teachers of the still famous and active Academy of Athens found themselves at loss about what to do. Following the rumors about the wonders of Persia, and especially of the brand new emperor Cosrace, who people said was exactly that philosopher king of which Plato talked in the Republic, they left for Ctesiphon, where Cosrace court was. Long story made short, they were quickly disappointed and decided to come back to, Roman, to the Roman Empire, even at cost of risking their lives because of their pagan religion. According to Agathias, something wonderful happened on their travel back in the Persian desert. It's a bit of a long passage, but I think it deserves to be read entirely. The story goes that on their return journey, they had an extraordinarily impressive and memorable experience. Thaumazion ti ilicon che mimi saxion. Stopping to rest in a field in Persia, they described the body of a man not long dead, 
flung down unceremoniously, unceremoniously without any attempt at burial. Moved to compassion by the sight of such outrageous barbarity and thinking it sinful to remain the passive spectators, spectators of an unnatural crime, they made their servants lay out the body as best as they could, cover it with earth and bury it. That night, when they were all asleep, one of their number, I cannot be more specific because I do not know his name, dreamed that he saw an old man who, though his face was unfamiliar and his identity could not even be surmised, had an air of dignity and decorum about him and resembled a philosopher in the style of his dress and in the fact that he had a long flowing beard. Apparently, by way of exhortation and advice, he recited it he recited the following verses to him in a loud voice. Bury not the man whom now you see, the man whom buried not you found. Mother Earth will not receive the mother ravisher till he be by dogs devoured on the ground. Agathias continues and tells that the philosopher woke up in terror. When the morning after they passed again by that spot, they found the corpse of the man unburied again, as though the earth had of its own accord cast him upon cast him up into the open and refused to protect him from being devoured. They thus interpreted the dream and concluded that the Persians reserved the fate of remaining unburied, is reserved the fate of remaining unburied and being torn to pieces by dogs as the just punishment of those who bent their full lusts upon their mothers. This passage is of pivotal interest for many reasons, but I would rather draw your attention to the fact that, as you all know, many similar hexametric, amphibolic oracles are to be found in Herodotus. And I think especially um, to that in Hipparchus' dream in Histories 5, um, 556-1, where I believe a similar play with figures of speech, especially etymological figures and alliteration, can be found. Now, this was the vision which, which Hipparchus saw in a dream. And the night before the Panathenea, he thought that a tall and godly man stood over him, uttering these riddling verses. Bear an unbearable lot, or lion be strong for the bearing, no man on earth doth wrong, but at last shall suffer requital. Um, the, 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 the figures of speech I'm talking about are, of course, those I put in, um, in bold. So we find in Agatheas, Thapteston uh, Athapton, Kusi Kurma, Meter Metrephtoron, Metrophtoron. And here again, we find Tleti Atleta, Tleti Atleta Tetleoti, Tisin Apotesi. Although I find this insufficient to claim that Agathias was precisely alluding to Hipparchus' um, dream, I believe that he certainly, certainly had in mind the important role played by oracles uh, in verses in Herodotus and by dreams, a, a real hallmark of Herodotian historiography. Just to mention some of them, we have Croesus' dream of his son at his death in book, four, in book first, Astyages' two dreams on his daughter of offspring, those we just mentioned, uh, the, the, the Ethiopian's dream at 2.139, or the dream of Ippias before the Battle of Marathon at 6.107. And yet, this is the only material precisely of this kind that we can find in Agathias. Whereas, just to quickly come back to Procopius, dreams, they are quite important. I will mention just one, and in passing, to provide a snapshot of another extraordinary similarity with Herodotus. The story we read that Wars 3, 10, 8, 17, where the dream of a bishop persuades Justinian to start the Vandalic campaign against the resistance of John the Cappadocian seems to me to closely echo that of Herodotus, uh, the passage of Herodotus 7, 10, 17. The two passages present remarkable similarities. We have two men, John the Cappadocian in Procopius and Artabanus in Herodotus, explaining their reasons for speaking and the main arguments for not going to war. In both cases, these arguments are related to the danger and uncertainty of the expedition. In both passages, the conclusion is built upon the same topic, which is the importance of planification and good deliberation. But more importantly, in both episodes, it is just through the intervention, the intervention of a dream 
that the sovereigns are persuaded to go to war. According to Herodotus, in fact, Xerxes had two different dreams where a great and a handsome man, Andra Megan, the, yeah, the guy, Eweidea, Eweidea, encouraged him not to change his mind and to lead his army against Greece. And at 717, the same man visited in dream also Atabanus, eventually convincing both him and Xerxes of the rightness of the expedition. In Procopius, a bishop asks for a private hearing to Justinian and claims that God himself has visited him in a dream and gave him orders to encourage the emperor. He will have God's support during the expedition. We could also spend a few words on this topos of this great, tall, good-looking man um, in dreams uh, in classical uh, and, and late antique literature, but I'm afraid we, we have no time. Let's just leave it as a possible stimulus for discussion. Um, because before we finish, I would just like to take a few more minutes of your time to talk about a completely different topic and one that has likely started to receive much attention also in Byzantine literature, which is that of ethnographic writing. It will be just a final suggestion also because it is uh, for me uh, at this time very much work in progress. Um, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to discuss it with you. If the discrepancy between the usage of this Herodotian material we just discussed, so prodigies, mirabilia, paradoxography, is huge in Agathias and Procopius, the situation is much different when it comes to ethnography, a genre whose practice, whose practice in historiography, as we all know, has been established precisely by Herodotus. This practice in the historiography of the sixth century was still not dead, though it will soon, around the seventh century, experience an undeniable decline, as Anthony Caldellis has recently argued and investigated in his 2013 book, Ethnography After Antiquity. So, in a way, Procopius and Agathias' works can be considered a sort of a swan song of the ethnographic practice in classicizing historiography before this disappearance. Both the words and the histories are filled with ethnography, the practice of writing about foreign people. What is more interesting is that also at this chronological height, the situation in the representation of the foreigner appears to be much more nuanced and multifaceted than the well-known narrative of a stark interposition between Greeks or Romans and the barbarian invaders and wreckers of the empire. Agathias now comes handy in the very first pages of the first book of the histories, the author has already inserted two ethnographical exorcises. In the second, the one on the Alamanni, we read information about the religious customs, which Agathias does not approve at all. But he also adds, for the rationality and folly of their beliefs can hardly fail, I think, to strike even those who practice them, unless they happen to be complete fools and as such can easily be eradicated. But all those who do not attain to the truth merit pity rather than censure, censure and fully deserve to be forgiven. It is not after all of their own accord that they fall into error, but in their search for moral goodness, they form a wrong judgment and thereafter cling tenaciously to whatever conclusions they have arrived at. The concept expressed in this passage is echoed also elsewhere and about other foreigners in this case, the Persians and their burial customs. Here we, we find uh, Agathias saying uh, that it is quite obvious that each of the various nations of mankind considers that any custom whatsoever, which is both universally accepted in their society and deeply rooted in their past, cannot fail to be perfect and sacrosanct, whereas whatever runs counter to it is deemed deplorable, contemptible, and unworthy of serious consideration. Nevertheless, people have always managed to find and then list the support of reasoned arguments from all quarters when their own conventions are involved. Such arguments may indeed be true, but they may also very well be spacious, spacious fabrications. So it does not strike me as particularly surprising that the Persians too should try to prove when accounting for their own customs that these are superior to anyone else's. And again, to conclude, shortly after, still on Persians, 
were it about their pantheon and religious rituals. Agathias says and writes that they pe pe perform sacrifices and practice purifications, that fire is considered an object of veneration and divination. He comments with such words. Um, the religion derived from many different peoples is composed in the most varied way, and this does not come to me as a surprise. I know of no other nation which underwent to such a variety of transformations and could not endure to stay long in the same condition, but it has been subject to numberless foreign dominations. It is only natural that still bears the stamp of many different notions and customs. Following and implementing on a suggestion made precisely by Caldellis in the book I mentioned before, I find such attitudes from Agathias worthy of attention. Several things are at play in these passages. The Socratic argument about ignorance and impossibility to attain the good, Christian terminology, as I write, I'm, I'm researching on the possible influence of contemporary homiletic language, but also what is labeled as cultural relativism, a concept that has been used in Herodotian studies for many years to describe the historian's attitude towards foreign people. I am aware that the topic is enormous and complex, and this is the reason why I decided to leave this as nothing more than a last suggestion. But I am sure that you all thought about one of the most well-known Herodotian passages, that about the King Darius and the Indian Kalatia at Histories, um, at Histories 3. 38, who practice cannibalism as funerary habit, but who in turn would never burn their dead as the Greeks do. Um, for if one were to propose to each person to choose the best customs and traditions of all, everyone after having carefully thought would choose their own. Up to this point, everyone deems their own habits by far the best. So firmly rooted at these beliefs, and it is, I think, rightly said in Pindar's poem that use and want is lot of all. The similarity of approach is extremely fascinating. And I believe that the presence of the Herodotian model, among others, in early Byzantine, history, in early Byzantine ethnography, in this case, is still to explore. The results could tell us something more than just the reuse of a model. They could perhaps help us also better appreciate the representation and perception of self and others, us and them in sixth century Byzantium. But that's probably the topic uh, for, for another talk or for your questions and remarks. Um, here you find some bibliography. I try to keep the Herodotian one at minimum and just to focus on um, other secondary literature. And I maybe this PowerPoint will circulate. So I'm also happy to provide more bibliography if someone's interested. And I thank you very much for listening. <laughs>